Hello there and welcome back to The Closet Historian and back to my studio for another crafting project. And that's right, after oh so many beetles and occasional moths, etc., I finally branched off into something a little bit more aquatic. And I am very happy with how this little orange buddy turned out, but I'm excited to make a few improvements and perhaps make an even larger one this next round. No one is surprised. So I have my beads and sequins already, and unfortunately this is a bit more of a pun than usual today, but let's go ahead and dive on in. So I did make this little red and orange trial koi here just to get my feet wet, as it were, with doing a fish-inspired brooch as opposed to the bugs, arachnids, and lepidoptera I'm more used to working on. But I do think I can improve upon that first version here. And I'll start by sketching out my curvy teardrop shape with a couple of extra fins here, my little koi fish shape. I wanted to make this a little bit larger this time and a little wider just because I think the relation between the head and the tail of the last brooch was off, so I think I want to make this buddy a little bit bulkier, a little chonkier through the middle as it were. But yes, this is just kind of an abstract curved teardrop shape with little fins drawn on. Kind of helps simplify the shape of what you're looking at. Of course, you can always look at reference pictures of koi fish to get good ideas for how to arrange these buddies. And just like the first trial fish I made, I'm going to start today by putting the eye on first. This may seem odd, but I think it helps the piece of felt come alive in a way that, that somehow esoterically helps me through the rest of the process. That sounds a little frou-frou, but uh, it worked the first time, so here I am doing it again. I sewed on a rather flat, round black bead here. This is actually a vintage uh, jet glass bead from the Victorian era, <laughs> but you can find similar beads that are not as weirdly precious as that. And then I cut two small lengths of smooth pearl silver boolean wire, silver being the closest I had to white laying around and stitch those lengths down on the top and bottom of my circle to create the eye for my koi fish here. Now I'm going to go ahead and stitch the first third or so of this teardrop shape that is going to become a fish eventually, hopefully. Uh, hopefully you will agree that it looks like a fish by the end in beadwork. So I will start with some tiny, tiny size 15 white seed beads and also size 11 seed beads, which is sort of the next standard size up. I have both matte white seed beads and shiny white seed beads, different textures of seed beads, even within the same color. And I'm going to start with all white because this fish will be mostly white today, but I want to create a more speckled effect like this using some red and black beads as well interspersed with the mainly white colorway for my fish today. And if you have seen any of my other beaded brooch videos, you're familiar with the technique I'm using to go ahead and fill this area in. I am using a length of beads and then couching that length down. So I'm stringing on however many beads I want for this full length of the section, including using some of the rectangular and square Tila beads here, which of course have two holes, which allows me to weave several strands together by using those beads as like a cross piece and gives a more woven, almost uh, mosaic tile effect in the end, which I really like to use on these sort of projects. And I'll just string on a variety of beads here and kind of trial each row as I go, holding the beads up to the last row to see if I think uh, I like how the colorful splotches are turning out, if I need more white, if I need more black, more red, etc. Just kind of playing with this as I go. There's no rhyme or reason to any of this. It is quite random, of course, just like the scales on a real koi fish would be. And sometimes I like to layer on extra felt to create just a little bit more dimension. Usually I puff things up from the inside later, which you'll see when I'm stuffing this with felt scraps at the very end. But uh, I did layer on another piece of felt here just on the head section to give this a little bit more dimensionality. I'm not sure this is super noticeable in the end, but I felt it was worth trying. And I am just using a single piece of Guterman all-purpose thread on a beading needle for all of this so far. Um, I will use doubled thread later, but for now I'm just using a single strand of thread. And again, I have Tila beads. I have different sizes of seed beads, mostly 15s and 11s, and then also tiny, tiny bugle beads that I'm interspersing in here. I do have matte and shiny beads, slightly transparent beads and fully opaque beads, just trying to keep the textures varied even within the same three colors. And to fill in some smaller spaces, uh, usually I use the size 15 seed beads because they are so very tiny, but I also have some more of the Boolean thread here in a check pearl. This is a red 
tiny coil of red wire basically and I'll cut a piece of that to use almost as a bead to fill in some of the blank sections I have left myself here within the sort of impressionistic beaded woven pattern that I'm using to fill in the head of my fish here. And you can see that the silver coil around the eye is left free for now. I will put a couple of very loose stitches down later to couch that into place, but for now I want to be able to move it around and stick beads kind of underneath up real close to the first black eye bead. That way that the eyebrow kind of raises above the beads around it and gives again more dimensionality and a little bit more texture to the whole thing. But I will fill in the first, again, third of the teardrop shape here with beads working in this same fashion, again, trying to create blotches of color, sort of different scales with the black and red on the mainly white fish. I do think having a wide variety of materials helps me create a rather specific look for this beadwork that I do on these brooches, but the idea in general is very adaptable to whatever materials you may have laying around or may have access to. And as always, I will link a couple of my favorite supply shops in the description below. Now for the larger fins on this buddy, I'm going to use large sequins and I have this T-pin here and a couple of large needles to poke holes in these sequins that I have cut down to size. These are large shell shaped sequins that come in many different colors and finishes over at my favorite Cartwright sequins. Speaking of places, I will link in the description below. And I can highly recommend buying a bunch of different colors of these, just grabbing all your favorites over there and then sticking them in a bowl, mixing them all up and then keeping them in jars in your studio because it is just fun to have a giant jar of these very pretty iridescent sequins laying around. But I chose some solid black and then a slightly transparent pearly white shell shaped sequin to go ahead and cut my fin shapes out of. Basically I just cut these shells in half and trimmed the edges down to size so that I could layer a few of these for each of the fins. Layering the semi-transparent white pearl sequin over the black gave me a very fun more natural look to these fins because of course a lot of koi fish fins if they are lighter color are quite transparent. But I'm just cutting these down to size and layering them as I see fit to fill in the shape of my fins here. And I will do the same for the tail of the fish as well, using mostly black at the tips of the tail so that it will kind of blend into whatever, let's face it, black garment I'm wearing this pinned onto probably. <clears throat> I, I suppose I could wear this with red as well or anything else, but let's face it, most things I wear are black. So the black tips of these fins will probably blend into what I'm wearing. So I wanted to keep that in mind as I was stitching these on. And I am just using, again, a needle or a T-pin to poke holes into these and kind of create whatever shape of sequin I want. Just using the big shell shape as a base and then cutting it down to size, poking new holes in that with that T-pin and then stitching these on. Because these are so transparent, I sewed on a couple of white sequins underneath where the last sort of bit of the fin would be so that it looks like scales shining through the fin here because why the heck not? Better than just having plain felt underneath there. And I would have used white felt for this if I had any on hand, but this was the lightest color I had, a light silvery gray, so I went ahead and used that. This is just a craft felt. Um, this is a wool blend craft felt as opposed to the pure acrylic craft felt that you can get at like Michael's or Joanne's. And you can find wool and wool blend craft felts online or probably from some specialty wool or um, yarn shops if you have such things in your area. But after I have stitched on all my large sequins for the larger fins, I'm going to go ahead and fill in the rest of my teardrop shape, the body of my fish here with different sizes of sequins, sewing them in rows. I am using cupped sequins for this, which is actually something you don't see me use very often. I actually bought these white sequins special for this project because I don't usually use cupped sequins. I do prefer flat sequins usually, but for the full fish scale effect, I did want a cupped sequin. So I'm using these with the cup facing towards the fish so that it's kind of beveled, uh, bulges out above 
the body of the felt, I suppose. And I am sewing these in rows and again, interspersing a couple of black or a couple of red sequins in as I see fit to create different splotches of colorful scales along the length of my fish here. And I am going to sew these in rows following along the teardrop shape, following along the ridge of fins along the back of the koi here. And I am still using just a single strand of all-purpose thread on my beading needle here. I do get my beading needles just at Michael's craft store. I can link the ones I use below. I think they're a size 12, nope, size 10 beading needle technically, although they don't have different sizes. So it's just the one beading needle they have there. Uh, and that's the one I use. I do have a couple of different textures of matte black sequins and different types of white shiny sequins or clear sequins that I will sprinkle in here every once in a while just again to vary the texture but mostly I'm just doing these in rows I'm starting with a size 8 sequin here then moving down to a size 6, 5, 4 as I get to the end of the tail just gradually decreasing the size of those again to help with the dimensionality of the final project. And here where the beads transition into sequins, I did layer some of the sequins right on top of the initial beadwork that I had done. And I did use some smaller shell-shaped sequins, which is not easy to say. Shell-shaped sequins by the seashore, goodness me, up here during this transition where I was kind of covering up some of the beads and making it flow into the sequins as naturally as I could. And I did actually layer on some very tiny white bar-shaped sequins along this area and along the full length of the project in the end just to give a little bit more sparkle because they catch the light really well. Um, they're kind of unseen until the light catches them, but I again want to add as much texture as possible. Another note about filling this in with sequins here is that I'm going to start on one side, work to the center of my fish, and then stop, go to the other side, work on the outside edge, and then work towards the center of the fish just so that each row layers on top of the last and kind of again builds up the dimensionality of the fish. How many times am I going to say that in this video? Don't take a shot every time I say dimensionality of the fish, which is a weird sentence in general. But for the more central rows of this, I am starting actually with a larger sequin. So I'm starting with a size 10 red sequin here. And then again, gradating down to the smaller sizes of sequins as I sew along the full length of my koi here, all the way back down to the tail. But I will continue in the same fashion, again, interspersing different colors of sequins, a couple of different little textures in here, but trying to mostly stick with the glossy white sequins so that that is the overall color of this. I wanted something black and white with a little bit of red. Actual koi fish are actually more of an orangey red than this. This is more of a true red, but you know, you do what you can with the sequins you have on hand. It's actually kind of hard to find opaque sequins that are not iridescent. Most of the time, opaque like colorful plastic sequins have an iridescent finish on them and you would think I wouldn't mind but sometimes I want just a pure gloss and that can be actually quite difficult to get a hold of weirdly enough I can find satin finish but just to find a solid color glossy sequin without iridescence it's not easy uh, if you have other resources for sequins that you know about do let me know uh, mostly I get my sequins from Cartwright sequins and then other little shops on Etsy is where I find most of my sequins there's some actually very fine sequin sellers on Etsy that have really unique fun things, but they are on the pricey side. No surprise there. Once I have the whole fish filled in with these rows of sequins, I again will sew on a couple of these extra little tiny rectangles that you see in the center of the screen there, just to add a bit more sparkle and a couple of clear sequins kind of to fill in any gaps, just catch the light a little bit more than even the glossy ones do. And now that my fish is finished, I have the lovely task of turning it into a brooch as opposed to just this piece of felt here, which is a little bit less fun than doing the sequining. The sequining is actually goes by quite quickly and is very fun. So the sequins are my favorite part of this whole thing. But now I'm carefully going around and cutting around the edges of my fish. I'm cutting quite close to the edges of the fins, just hiding the edge of the felt underneath the overlap of the sequin itself. And then for everywhere around the main body of the fish, I'm cutting this into sort of centimeter long and wide tabs that I can fold to the inside of the fish. And I will actually stuff that with all these extra little bits I am cutting off. 
to give a little bit of volume to this fish here. So I'm going to fold my tabs in, kind of hold them into place, and then all the stitching on the back of this, because this is all going to be unseen, this is structural stitching, not pretty stitching. So I'm just whipping stitches in here, holding the tabs together, folding them in on themselves, and using the extra bits of felt to puff this up as I go, and really just kind of create a stuffed animal on the back here, whereas the top side of this is quite hard with its sequin coated finish. Next up, I'll set this buddy on top of a spare piece of cotton buckram here. This is actually a cotton and or paper fiber that has been, been stiffened with some sort of like gluey sizing that is used for hat making, but I will just cut a spare piece of this to kind of stiffen the body of my fish here and give it a little bit more stability. So I'm just tracing a rough copy of the shape here, and then when I hold it up to the fish and pin it into place with some bent pens that I keep here on my desk just for this purpose. Um, they're already bent, so I don't mind bending them a little bit further to do weird 3D stuff like this. I'll pin this into place, and then I'll actually use blanket stitch around the edges to stitch this down to the felt beneath. And this gives just a little bit more stability, especially before I put the pin back on here and things like that. If you were going to be creating really dimensional pieces like this, you could even stick two of these together that were mirrored to create like a full like fish if you wanted to, um, perhaps as a hat trimming or as just like a decorative object. Although these on a like very Scaparelli hat would be quite fun. But to give this even more structure and a little bit of poseability in the end, I'm actually going to stitch on a piece of bendable but thick wire that I had laying around. Again, this is probably like an 18 or 19 gauge wire. No idea. It was a random piece of brass wire that was in my like junk bead drawer down here. I have a drawer full of beads and findings and junk that I've accumulated over the last, I don't know, 20 years. So I uh, rummaged through there and found some spare craft wire to stitch on here. But I just wanted to layer this in here as I'm stitching the top side of this buckram down onto the felt below just to give this a little bit more posability in the end because I want to be able to curve the brooch just a tiny bit so that it's cupped down onto the surface of the blazer I'll probably be wearing this on. Just because it is so large, having this little tiny pin back on the back it's kind of be not the best, I don't know, way to, ex like it would be better if I did two pin backs or a larger pin back, but I'm just using the pin backs that I have. And this is actually the second to last of these nicer pin backs I have from this order I made a long time ago and the supplier no longer has these. These were a bit of a nicer, slightly upgraded crafty pin back compared to the ones you can get at the craft store. And so now I'm really bummed that I don't really have a source for more like fine jewelry quality pin backs. So again, if you know where I can get those, let me know. Uh, the, again, this is not like a regular pin back. This is a slightly nicer, more refined, less catch on everything, less cheap aluminum pin back finding. And I wish I could find more like it. Premium pin backs. How fancy. But yes, I had sewn on my first piece of craft wire, actually another twisted piece down on the head portion of this as well, just again to give this a little bit more structure and yet also bendability. And now that I have stitched on my pin back, I can go ahead and cover up all this mess with a last piece of backing felt here. So again, I will hold up the fish to the piece of felt that I originally used to make this friend, kind of give it a rough sketch, cut out the rough shape, and then hold this up to the back and mark where I need to cut slits in the felt for the start and end of my pin back here. And once I have clipped those indications, I can slip this on over the pin back so that even the pin back is hidden back here. And then I'll cut the rest of this felt down just along the edge. And I will do a final blanket stitch to hold it down to the rest of the piece underneath. And I'm still using white thread on this light gray. So my stitches are quite visible back here. But if you were making small patient stitches as you went around, <clears throat> which is I'm not exactly doing here, and you were using a matching color thread, this would be quite invisible. I think a lot of people glue the final backing on. I think a lot of people use leather or suede for this, but I think the felt is just fine. Again, it's not going to be seen by anyone but me. If you're making these to sell, maybe a fancier finish in the back, but uh, I'm making them to wear and to love over time. They're, they're, just, they're just for me. I really am just making these for my own enjoyment, which is why I make them so large and sparkly as well, because I don't know if everyone loves a 
giant brooch the way I do. But once I had stitched the final felt backing on all the way around and hidden all my stitches, covered up all the mess in the back with that last piece of felt, this little koi fish is finished. I hope you enjoyed seeing how this project came together today and thank you as always for watching. I'll be back with more sewing, vintage fashion, costuming, and crafting real soon, so I'll see you then. Bye!